Praise the Lord, everybody. We are going to pick up where we left off last week on 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Second Corinthians chapter 7. And I know this is where we left off. And so I'm just going to, we'll, we'll read verses 10 through 12 and then pick up from there. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things ye approved yourselves to be clear in this matter wherefore I wherefore though I wrote unto you I did it not for this cause for his cause that had done the wrong nor for his cause that suffered wrong but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you so he did not write this because of the sin that this young man had committed and he didn't write it to his father whose wife he was cheating with. He wrote it to the church who had found themselves wrong for the sin that they had committed. But he gives here a very detailed description of what repentance truly looks like. I believe I said this last week and I'll say it again. If you have to get caught then you're not repented you're just sorry. If God has to hunt you down for what you've done then that's not truly what repentance is. So a person that has repented demonstrates certain things. He says, if you have repented with a godly sorrow, what carefulness it's going to bring in you. Now, when he talks about carefulness, what does he mean by that? Does anybody have any idea? Yes, sir. Taking, he said, taking different steps to keep yourself from falling again. Absolutely. I don't want to do anything that's going to get me near the wrong that I did before. If I was tempted to steal a pack of gum from the grocery store, that's just my thing. I have a love for gum, all kinds of gum. I don't have any money, but I love me some gum. So I go in the store and I stole me some gum. Well, the next time I go to the store, I'm going to stay away from the aisle that's got the gum in it. And I'm not going to go to the Acme gum store downtown. I'm not going to do that because if I go in there, that's where all my temptation lies. Matter of fact, I'm going to do whatever it takes to stay out of the store anyway because I don't want to get trapped up into walking down the aisle and somebody done dropped a pack of gum and I might see it. I'll do what it takes to stay away from the wrong. There's another, there's another way to look at this. Sometimes saints are very careless with their walk with God. They don't talk to him. They don't read their Bible. They come to church when they feel like it. If they don't feel like it, they stay home. Now, that doesn't mean that anybody that doesn't come to church 
is doing so because they're careless with their life, with their spiritual walk. Because sometimes people are sick. Sometimes they're at work. But if you're home because your, your show is on, and if you don't think that's a problem, just wait until Super Bowl time comes around. They got churches that cancel Sunday service for people to be able to stay home and watch the Super Bowl. Super Bowl don't even start till the evening, but they want to catch all the pregame stuff. And so I've, I've heard pastors say, we're going to have an abbreviated service today. We're going to have a brief service so that uh, we can get home and catch the game. Matter of fact, there was a church in Indianapolis that the uh, NFL had to send them a letter and tell them, do not play our game in your church or we'll sue you. Because they had advertised publicly that they had a giant flat screen TV for all the church members. They were going to come over and after service they had all the fixings. Snacks, food, drink, and you can stay at the church. You don't even have to leave morning service. You can stay after church and watch the game. And it got in the newspaper. And the NFL contacted them and told them, don't do it or we'll sue you. What does that have to do with God? Well, it kind of gives you an idea how people can become careless in their walk with God because their leadership is careless in their approach to God. When we come to church, it's serious. And there are some people, when they first get the Holy Ghost, they on fire for Jesus. Speaking in tongues every service. Crying out all the time. But after a while, by and by, the honey comes off the moon. And then it's, well, I, I think... I think I feel something in my neck. Uh, I, I probably shouldn't go to church in that. I need to stay home and rest because I got to go to work in the morning. And then it's, well, you know, I'll just stay home and read my Bible. And after a while, you don't see them anymore. Careless. Amen, anybody? Amen. When, when a person that has been out of fellowship with the church knows what it tastes like to be spanked or as the scripture says, to be ripped at, torn by the devil, when they come back, they're careful. I don't want to do anything that's going to get me back out there into that again they're really careful now let me give you a natural a natural um, example of what I'm talking about here about six weeks two months ago I had kidney stones and things tore me up thought I was going to die took, took me two three days to pass them kidney stones they said, well, deep fried foods, a lack of vegetables, dark colored sodas, all of these things can cause you to have kidney stones. I ain't ate nothing deep fried since. <laughs> I've not drank anything except water. And a half a gallon to three quarters of a gallon of that a day, every day, been eating my veggie tables. You know why? Because I'm real careful. I don't ever want to go through that again. That's what happens when you go out in the street and the devil gets a hold of you. When you are truly repented, you are careful. I don't want to go around anything that might cause me to be back out into that again. I don't want to be around anybody that's trying to talk me out into that again. So I know when people say, when they come back, I'll come back to the, I want to come back to the Lord. And, and we talk and, and I pray for them. 
And a couple of days later, I see them walking down the street with the same dope heads they was hanging out with before. I know they ain't serious. You're not even careful. But a person that's truly careful, they block their number from their phone. They drive through other, they'll go all out around the neighborhood to get to another, to get to where they're going so they don't have to drive by the same people that used to get them in trouble. They see their car at the grocery store, they turn around and say, I'll go later on this evening. That's somebody that's careful. I don't want to mess up with God again. I'm staying away from it. I don't want to see him. I don't want to be around him. Every time I see him, it's a little twinge of embarrassment. I let them pull me out away from God. I stay away from him. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Now, I'm not, I, I don't mean that you have backslid and come back. I mean, do you understand what I mean? What it, it means to, to be careful. So, if you come back to the Lord and your first question out of your mouth is, what am I going to do about my girlfriend that's living with me? You ain't serious. I know that. Now, I'll tell you, you can't live with her. Either she needs to go or you need to go, but you can't live with her. But I know when you start asking that, those kind of questions. I'm going to say this. Someone came and backslidden. They wanted to come back to the Lord. They came in to talk to me and was telling me what they had done while they were out. And I said, well, you know, I started smoking cigarettes while I was gone. And I just want to know, is it okay if I vape? I mean, that's not really smoking cigarettes. I knew right then they wasn't serious. Vape, that's those electronic cigarettes. They give you nicotine, but they don't have all the chemicals in it. I, I knew right then. They wasn't serious. They was here for two or three weeks, and then I didn't see them no more after that because I told them, no, you, you, we don't vape. We don't do things like that. So I, I'm saying this because I don't want people to feel like, oh, it must be some really spiritual thing that the Holy Ghost is moving on the pastor and he knows they're not going to make it. That's not it. You tell on your own self. I already know what the fruit of repentance is. And the moment I see you come in and the first thing you start doing is trying to figure out where the boundaries are, no, you're not serious. The second thing is, yea, what clearing? When I have repented, I want to clear my name. All right, now I, I want to use an example. And I'm using Brother Delshawn because he's getting married Friday. And I might as well beat him up while I can. That way, before his wife jumps on me. No, I forgot to announce that. Uh, everyone, Brother Delshawn and Sister Amanda are getting married Friday. I want y'all to be spiritual and be to church Sunday morning early. I'm teasing. I'm, t I'm teasing. He that desires the wife, desires the things of this world, and how he may please her. Amen. So uh, some priorities are probably going to change, or you won't be married long. Yea, what clearing. So... Brother Delshawn comes over to my house. I've got a hundred dollar bill laying on my dresser and he's over visiting me while I'm sick. I ask him will he go in the bedroom and get my cough syrup for me. He sees that hundred dollar bill on my dresser, slides it in his pocket. He gives me my cough syrup and says, let me get out of here real quick 
before I get sick too. Now, he felt guilty about it before he put the money in his pocket. He felt guilty after he put the money in his pocket. When he was driving out my driveway, he was feeling guilty about stealing that $100 off of my dresser. A couple of days later, he says, I can't take it no more, Lord. I'm going to go confess I stole that $100. Well, he ain't clear until he give me my $100 back. That's what clearing will do. If you want to be clear, you'll say, and I need to give this back to Brother Johnson. I stole this from him. That's clearing yourself, isn't it? Now, there's some things you can't clear from. Does anybody have any ideas what you cannot clear yourself from? He said murder, blaspheming, suicide, fornication. Oh, fornication's a good one. You can't clear yourself from that. No. You can be sorry, but you can't restore that. You can't restore somebody's life if you take it. You can't restore your own if you take it. And I've heard people try their best to argue that it's possible for someone that commits suicide to still go to heaven. I've heard them try to argue that. But you can't repent after you just took 25 sleeping pills and while you're laying there drifting off to sleep, you repent. It doesn't work like that. If you kill yourself, you just killed someone's child. People don't think about it like that. But you did. You just murdered someone's kid. And how do you, how do you repent while you're in the midst of killing them? Well, brother, brother, let me give you an example. Brother Delshawn brings me my $100 back. And when he does, I punch him and knock him out and start choking him. And while I'm choking him, I'm repenting that I'm killing him. You can't do that. Well, that's what you're doing to your own self. And while you're killing you, you can't repent while you're doing it. Clearing is making restitution for your wrong. When Zacchaeus repented and Jesus talked to him, what did he say? Zacchaeus said, I'm going to return what I took sevenfold. I'm going to repay it back. Jesus didn't tell him, now go give it all back sevenfold. He, Jesus didn't tell him that. But see, he wanted to make restitution for the wrong that he did. That is the fruit of repentance. I want to clear myself with God and whoever I'm wrong with. I want to clear that. And if I've damaged you in some kind of way, I want to restore that back. If you say, I've repented, and let me just go back again, and we use this example again with Brother Delshawn. If he says now, I stole some money from somebody. I just wanted you to know that. Pray for me. I stole some money from somebody. Well, brother, who did you steal from? Well, I stole from Brother Johnson. I see. well, what did you do with the money? I still have it. Well, you need to give it back to him. Well, I'm too embarrassed to do that. Would you give it to him? That's not clearing now, is it? You still aren't taking ownership. You still aren't taking responsibility for what you have done. Shame on you, brother. Hurry up and get married. When you have truly repented, you want to restore whatever it is that you have damaged. So when somebody says, I got angry and I keyed their car because they made me mad, and they say, well, you need to pay for that. 
Well, I don't have the money for that. That's what they got insurance for. You haven't repented. Because if you've repented, you say, even though they've got insurance, I've wasted a lot of their time. I've damaged their vehicle. Whatever it costs, it's $900 to get it refixed. I'll start making payments. I want to pay that back. Or if I got the money, I'm going to pay it. Yes, but their insurance paid for it. I don't care. I did the damage and I'm going to pay for it. I don't care what they do with the money, but I'm going to fix this. That's repentance. I get all kind of stories when folks come and talk with me. I get all kind of stories. Well, why should I? Well, how come you haven't said anything to them? Well, then how come you're in my office if you're worried about that? Saints do that all the time. Well, did you say something to them? Why, why is that a concern of yours? If you're confessing about something you did wrong, why are you worried about what anybody else did? You know what I want to do? I want to clear my own self and make restitution for any damage that I've done. Now, if nobody else wants to do that, that's what I want to do because I am truly repented. I am truly sorry for what I have done, and I want to make that right. When someone is repentant and I say, I'll pray for you, but you're silenced for 30 days, you're silenced for 60 days, this is what I don't get. I don't get, ooh, yeah, but I'm a usher and I'm supposed to be up next week. Is there, can you start it the week after that so nobody know? No, that's not repentance. Oh, come on, saints. Why are y'all so quiet? That's not repentance. You know what repentance says? I did, the punish I did the crime. I'll take the punishment. I want to clear this thing with God. And if you say that I'm, a, I'm silenced for 60 days, then that's what I am. If you say I'm silenced for a year, I'll take it. I'm the one that did wrong. Amen, anybody? Amen. I've been disciplined before, and I never fussed about it. I knew I was wrong. I knew I deserved that punishment or more. I never fussed. Now, I'm not saying that I've always repented when I've done wrong right away. Sometimes I had to get my attitude together. But when I got punished, I never argued with the pastor over it. I never tried to tell him, I don't deserve this. Don't you think that's being a little harsh? Never. I took my punishment and went on by my business. Yea, what indignation. Does anybody know what indignation is? It's anger. So I'm angry at the devil. You're angry at yourself. That's right. I'm angry at me for allowing myself to be put in that position. Has anyone ever done anything and felt really foolish afterwards and said, I should have known better than that? That, that will make you say, you got me this time, but you'll never get me again. Now, I'm not mad necessarily at you. I'm mad at the fact that I allowed myself to get tricked. Yes, ma'am. She said, isn't that heated anger? Yes, it is. I am angry at me for letting the devil trick me. I am angry at me for letting my flesh trick me. Everything ain't the devil. Sometimes it's my flesh. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First, first Corinthians chapter 9, verse 12. No. Verse, it's going to be verse 27. This is, what, this is what you do to you. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself 
should be a castaway. Now, this is a very good scripture against those that believe once you saved, you are always saved. Paul wasn't saying this as a loose example that will never happen, but just to scare you guys into acting right. That's not what he was doing. He's saying, I make sure that I keep this body under control. You know why? Because if I don't make this body be in subjection, it will run wild. It'll do what it wants to do. When this flesh runs wild, it'll slap somebody. It'll kick dirt at somebody. It'll slam doors. It'll intentionally break things. When this flesh runs wild, it'll do all kinds of stuff. It'll wink at women that ain't your wife. It'll make you wear clothes with your line, your neckline down because the IT guy is going to be in today to fix my computer and he looks good. That's what happens when your flesh is running wild. When flesh runs wild, it uses profanity. <clears throat> when flesh runs wild, it'll make your pants hang down below your waist. Yeah, we got any saggers in here? All right. We, we don't, we're no saggers. Amen. All the brothers in this church got on belts. Hallelujah. That's what happens when your flesh runs wild. Amen. Are y'all getting the flesh running wild? I keep it in subjection. It wants to do it. Every time I drive by McDonald's, I think about a large Diet Coke. And then I think about the pain I was in and I say, oh no, you ain't getting that. Mm -hmm. I keep it in subjection because the ultimate outcome of letting my flesh do what it wants to do is it will make me be a castaway. So, when it wants to do wrong, it makes me angry. No, you're not going to do that. No, you're not going over there. All right, I'm going to leave that alone. Yea, what fear. Fear, there's more than one definition of fear. It means to revere or to, to hold in reverence. It means a dread of displeasing God. It means to approach God in a respectful way. So, yay, what fear? What kind of fear are we talking about? A dread of displeasing God. There's no way I want him to be upset with me again. I don't want that. I have done things before and felt so horrible about it. it. Felt terrible. And I got myself cleaned up and I still felt terrible about it. It was a long time before I kind of got over that. I did not want to be found displeasing to God again. When I found out it was wrong, I, I didn't want that to happen again. Now let me tell you what it'll do. I was going in and fessing up the stuff. I was so scared of displeasing God. I was confessing the things I hadn't even done. Just come to my mind. I was like that. You know, well, if it came to my mind, I was scared. I didn't want to be wrong with God. I was telling everything. Finally, the pastor was like, what, what are you talking about? I mean, this went on for more than a year. He said, what do you mean by this? And I told him, he said, brother, that ain't nothing. Go on about your business. I said, well, I just don't want to be wrong with God. He said, well, stop that. I was, I was so scared of displeasing God, I was about to get myself in trouble with God for confessing about stuff I hadn't even done. But 
I heard somebody one time confess this this saint said I need to be silenced because I committed adultery the pastor said with who well it was in my heart so you know it, the Bible says if it was in your heart you've done it so I need to be silenced the pastor said I'm not going to silence you for that well, come to find out it was in more than his heart it was in his bed too <laughs> but he wasn't telling all that he was only telling part of it you see so you can confess right and confess wrong I was overdoing it and he was underdoing it don't talk about what you had in your heart no brother you really did it it wasn't just here all right Psalm chapter 55 Psalm 55, Psalm 55, and we're going to read verse number 19, in just a moment. God shall hear and afflict them, even he that abideth of old. Because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. So you want to know, how do you know if I have a proper fear? Yea, what fear? Because there's changes in my life. They that don't change... It's because they don't fear God. So you can't say, who I really respect the Lord, and you're still acting ugly. Can't say that. Or can you? Am I wrong here? You're all so quiet, you're scaring me. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 9. What shall we say then? Or what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. Romans chapter 8 verse 9. What? Come on, y'all. I'm trying to make me feel like I, I don't know what I'm talking about. Romans 8. Oh. Romans 8. I said, what then? Maybe I inverted my... Romans 31. Romans 9. No, that's not it. Let's see. What then? Are we better than they? Uh, yeah, what he said. <laughs> Romans chapter 3 and verse 9. Yes. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, 
No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Now, let's just stop it just for a moment. Because a lot of times people want to argue about their loved ones and talk about how good they are and how decent of people they are. But the scripture is clear, and Paul says it multiple times. There is none good. Jesus said it like this. There is none good but one. And that's God. And then he turns around and says, I am the good shepherd. What is he saying? If there's none good but one, how's he the good shepherd? Unless he is God. All right, that's another Bible class. They are all together become unprofitable. There's none good. No, not one. They are mostly gone out of the way. No, they are all gone out of the way. Nobody has a claim to being good without the Holy Ghost. Verse 13, their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. <coughs> the poison of asp is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And they and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. A person that doesn't fear God Their tongue is out of control. It's full of poison, deceit. A person that doesn't fear God, their mouth is full of cursings and bitterness. Now, cursing, is that talking about using profanity? He's cursing at me. I hear people who say it like that. But is that talking about profanity? That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about the person that's so angry they ain't got nothing good to say about you. They're going to get theirs. That's somebody that doesn't fear God. When you hear people say, uh-huh, their time is coming and I can't wait to see it. They don't scare. They're not, they're not afraid or have any respect for God. Uh, bitterness. I hate them. Can't stand them. Or how about this one? This is my favorite because this is going to really stir up something. Since y'all want to be real quiet, let me just open up the can. <clears throat> oh, I've forgiven them, but I won't forget. That's bitterness. Can't get over it. All right. Their feet are swift to shed blood. I don't understand this. I'm careful about helping somebody, but when it comes down to hurting them, I jump right in on the bandwagon. We hurt people. He's saying shed blood. Let's be more generic. Hurting people. We will hurt people. We hurt their livelihoods. We will hurt their family structure. Do you know that when you go into a home where there's a husband and a wife and children and you tiptoe in and commit fornication or adultery, you are breaking up that family. You are causing damage that can never be undone. Even if they talk about it and they forgive and forget and move on, you have still caused irreparable damage. Every time you're around, do you think that that's not going to hurt them? Now, I'm not, I don't mean that they necessarily want to get even with you. You think that's not a hurt? It hurts. Oh, 
Y'all so quiet, I'm wondering if anybody's done that up in here. Boy. It, you are causing damage to someone's home. I've heard people say this, and this is terrible. I can't stand them. If they was across the street on fire, I wouldn't walk over and spit on them. That's a terrible thing to say. That's bitterness. That's, that's hateful talking. Can I go a little further? All right. President Washington did this, that, and the other. And I completely support him. And anybody on my Facebook page that don't agree with me, you blocked. What a saints got any business doing stuff like that? We don't. Or do we? Am I wrong here? Oh, no. Okay. Well, the governor signed this piece of legislation. I'm so mad. Anybody, and this is a shame. Saints want to fight over whether they're Republicans or Democrats. That's just foolishness. Be whatever you want to be. Be a Republican if you want. It don't matter. We ain't got no business taking sides like that where I, I, I can't even speak to you. That's your governor. That's hate. Listen, I'm not, that's what the world does. Let me tell you what they've done. We have so, we have so separated our country that I believe we're going to see what Jesus said. A house divided against itself cannot stand. We steady fighting each other over what, what we think somebody said. What we think they meant by what they said. I heard a news commentator say this. Well, it doesn't it doesn't do any good to try and figure out what the president meant by the words that he said because usually what he said is pretty point blank. Now, you know why they're saying that? Because in the past they would say things like, um, well, the president decided to cut a trillion dollars off of road projects and then someone would come along, the governor would come along and say, that's regrettable. And they said, now when he said regrettable, that's really strong language, regrettable. Well, it, it, that doesn't happen with this president. He just says what he feels like saying. He, nobody's going around trying to figure out what he meant by when he threw the word the in there. Did that mean something special? We have so separated ourselves that we're ready to fist fight each other over something we think the president said, what we think the governor meant by what he said. Save people. I'm not talking about out in the street. I'm not talking about people that don't have a Holy Ghost. I'm talking about folks baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, looking for a city whose builder and maker is God, arguing and fighting over what somebody else did in another city. That doesn't make sense for us. You know what we should be doing? Praying that the decisions that the president, that our congressmen, our senators, our governor, that all of the decisions that they're making, the laws that they are passing, allows us to continue to worship God freely and openly. That should be our prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the person that has repented has a fear for the things of God. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah. Isaiah 58 and verse 13. Amen. 
Isaiah 58, 13. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then thou shalt delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon mine high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. When? When you are not trying to seek your own pleasure, when you should be seeking God. Some folks can't come to church because they out having fun. Now listen, I just bought a brand new boat. We, ain't got, we only have two more weekends of sunny weather before winter hits, so uh, we won't be there for the next couple of weeks. I'm seeking my own pleasure when I should be seeking the holy day of the Lord. Well, my team has finally made it into the playoffs. And this is the first time they've done that in 80 years. So I, I'm staying home because the game is on. What am I seeking? My pleasure. That's still the Lord. That's not far-fetched, saints. Summer is almost at an end. I need to get to the beach. I need one last good tan before winter hits. I'm, so I won't be at church Sunday. No, I won't take Saturday and go have fun. Sunday, you know, I got to interrupt my service to God to go have fun. He said, when you, if thou turn thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, when you turn your foot from having fun on my day and give me some respect, that's when I'm going to bless you. The person that has a proper respect and fear for God is not interested in going out and having fun on Sunday. Some folks are so anxious, they got to hurry up and leave. They steady looking at the clock. We read another scripture. I say a couple of more things. Because they're in a hurry to get up out of church. You know what you're seeking? Your own pleasure. I, I just bought a brand new $7,000 sleep number bed. Dual adjustable. It's got body molding and it has heating and cooling in the foam mattress. That one's actually $9,000. You think I want to be here all night? I need to get home and get in that bed. I done paid way too much money for that. That's seeking your own pleasure instead of the things of the Lord. All right. Yea, what vehement desire. Now, vehement desire and zeal are, are very, very close together. So let's just jump down. We'll deal with zeal. Because zeal and vehement desire are so close it's hard to even really separate them. This is the person that returns to God that when they come back, You find them busier than they was before they left God. You find them serving God stronger than they did than when they first got the Holy Ghost. I have such a strong desire and zeal, a fervent desire for God, such a zeal for God now that when they come back and they offer their silence and I say, why don't you go see the head usher and see if you, why don't you start ushering? Uh, I never really liked 
Usher in. I'm just, I, that's not my thing. Uh, you mind if I just drive the bus? That's not a zeal. That's not a vehement desire. The person that is in love with God, what I'm asked to do, I'm doing it. You off your silence. Go on out there and run the vacuum sweeper. Okay, where is it at? <laughs> she said, in the closet. <laughs> it's a shame that a lot of times people don't get on fire for God until after they've backslidden and come back. Now they're on fire for the Lord. That's a shame. But sometimes that's what it takes. It takes them going back out there and realizing the world is a far more terrible place than I thought. I'm so glad God brought me back. Whatever I have to do, I'm going to do it. Whatever is asked of me to do, I'm going to do it. A person that's truly repented, they're not arguing and fighting over every little thing. I didn't drop the paper on the floor. Why are you asking me to pick it up? I have watched saints walk past tissue sitting on the floor and step over it. Let the ushers get it. And then I heard somebody else saw someone picking up the, the song books and they said, what are you doing that for? You ain't an usher. Why would you try to stop somebody that wants to do something for the church? I said, keep on doing what you're doing. Because some folks want to sit back and play traffic director. Now you go do this. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not your job. You come over and do that. And they're not doing anything. Do you know who I get the most complaints from? From the 90% that do less than 10%. That's who most of the... Now, the few that are doing stuff, I don't get complaints from them. They're doing things. They're busy. If all you can see is flaws, it's probably because you're sitting still too long. Uh, let, me, let me just say it this way. If I'm driving down the street 100 miles an hour, I'm not really paying attention to anything on the side of the road. If I'm riding my bicycle, I'll notice things. If I'm walking, I'll see everything. The person that's busy doing stuff, they don't notice a whole lot because they're so busy. When you always coming up saying, well, what are we going to do about this? Well, I saw so-and-so walking in the back of the church and they had snow on their boots. and you know, I don't think they need to be coming up in the church with snow on their boots. Uh, you need to tell them not to do that. It's like, well, you, what are you doing? Hey, it would be different if you came up and said, listen, I think it looks bad, clumps of snow in the back of the church. So I went out and I started looking around and researching, and I found all of these different kind of mats. This one is kind of cheap. Matter of fact, I'm willing to help pay for it because I don't like seeing all that snow back there. It looks bad. You know the snow is on my mind? Hey, man, I can't wait. Yes. Anyway, I, there are some people who find problems and other people who try to fix problems. And there's times when folks will come to me and I'm so tired of them fussing about every single thing they see. My first question is this. Well, what do you think should be done about that? You know why? Because all they want to do is bring me problems. All they want to do is bring me things that's getting on their nerves. So, well, it's bothering you? Well, have you taken some time to think about it? What, what, what do you suggest should be done? Well, I don't know. And I said, well, come back when you do. Come back with some ideas. Amen? So the next time you come and ask me something and I say, what do you think? You know you've been fussing a lot. Hopefully that's going to scare some folks off of coming and telling me something. <laughs> Yea, what revenge. This is not revenge on the pastor for catching you doing wrong. 
this is not revenge on the pastor because he gave you 30 days for it. This is revenge on your flesh, on you, for having done wrong to God. I'm just going to use this example because I heard, um, I heard one of our bishops say this, that someone came in and confessed to doing wrong, and the pastor told him, I'm going to pray for you, and he said, no, I need to be silenced, and he said, no, it wasn't that serious of a thing. He said, no, 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 pastor. I'm sitting myself down for 30 days. I I'm, I'm, I'm feel bad about what I did. And you don't feel like I need to be punished, but I'm going to punish me for what I've done. Now, please don't come in the office and tell me that you're going to silence yourself. That's my job, not yours. But this shows the attitude of the person. It shows the attitude of someone who's repented about what they've done. Whatever the punishment is, I don't even feel like that's strong enough. I deserve more. Most of the time when I was growing up, I felt like I deserved less. Because rawhide, whew, I don't feel like I deserve that. No. But there were things that I did do wrong, and when I got punished for it, I knew I was wrong and I deserved more than that. I was grateful. I was grateful to get off with a, don't you ever do that again. I knew I deserved much more. All right. Any questions? All right. Well, then next, next week, next week we will cover uh, why you can't restore your own self to God. All right, stand on your feet.